All right, good morning. We're back here in the first week of May. Now, uh, as I mentioned last week, we will be in Romans all this month. And uh, this may well be one of the last books or letters that Paul wrote. And uh, uh, we, we don't know a lot that happened after he wrote Romans. It may have been written from Corinth uh, to the Romans. And he wanted to go to Rome. That's one of the things he talks about at the beginning of the letter, as well as uh, other places that he hopes to stop in Rome on his way to Spain. And he mentioned Spain in particular uh, because he wants to go there, and he hasn't been there before either. Um, he, we don't know whether he ever got there or not. There's kind of, some people feel that he may indeed have gotten there and then came back to Rome. Uh, we know that he died at Rome, as did Peter. Uh, both of them were, were in prison, and uh, Peter was crucified, and Paul was beheaded. Uh, those were pretty much acceptable uh, from tradition and uh, uh, that experience. And, and the book of Acts, too, uh, carries a lot of that information in it. Anyway, we're going to be talking about Romans for the next uh, month here. And then in June, we'll be back to visit Romans, but also some other books like Galatians and Corinthians. Uh, again, talking about doctrine. Uh, so, uh, it's a little bit of a struggle. Uh, when you read Romans, uh, sometimes you can get confused. You say, what did he say? Uh, and you, you try to go back to it. I'm going to try to keep it as simple uh, as, as I can in terms of that, and yet get the, the message without perhaps getting all of the, uh, the language and the jargon and the terms in it. Now, as we begin, I want to say that there is a factor here. Um, in seminary, we, we had to take theology and study like that. And it, it has a term called metaphysics. Um, metaphysics uh, has the idea of, um, of something that changes. We got the word metamorphosis. Uh, it means it changes into a different state. Uh, well, metaphysics is, is kind of going beyond the state of the physical into the mental and the supernatural. And that's what it is. Um, we have a word called metaphor. Metaphor is when you take something and you make it like. And that word like has to do with it. So we can talk about a ship plowing through the sea. Uh, that's a metaphor. The ships don't really plow, uh, but the idea is. And um, we talk about the wagons going west as being prairie schooners. Well, schooner was a boat that sailed on the ocean, but the top of the wagon and the covering on it gave the impression of, of like the sails of a ship. So that was a metaphor uh, for that. Well, Paul's going to use metaphors in Romans a lot. And uh, so he will speak uh, about adoption. Um, we're not really adopted, but it's like we're adopted. Uh, and uh, the word reckon will come up in the book of Romans. And, and reckon doesn't mean that you are something. It means that you're treated as though you are something. So uh, in one sense, we're not adopted, but God treats us as though we were adopted. And Paul will speak about our being adopted um, in, into the family of God. Um, formally, it doesn't happen but it does happen, and it becomes our justification. And that's another key word that comes up time and time again in the book of Romans, justify. Uh, and, and justify comes from a Greek word, um, logos. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That, that word for word is logos. And we get our word uh, logistics. Uh, George is a trucker. Uh, he knows about logistics. That's the log or the... Uh, schedule that you have, uh, but we also get our word logic, and that means our way of thinking uh, and, and wanting to think correctly. So God treats us um, in the way that he looks at us. So uh, sometimes we say, God doesn't like us, but he loves us. Um, that's, that's a pretty strong factor in it. There's a lot of things that, that I do that my family doesn't like, but there's, there's not a question of whether they love me or not. Um, they love me to change some, but they still love me even if they don't like me or like everything about me. And, and that's true with God. Um, 
God loves us, and that becomes the basis of everything that happened. So we're looking at the third chapter of Romans uh, today, and in that uh, we're, we're at verse 21. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now, if you go back to the beginning of, of Romans, uh, he introduces us uh, to the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Now, he's going to talk in chapter 3 about the, the sameness of the Jew and the Gentile, but at the beginning of that chapter, he talks about the difference. And at that point, he talks about the law. And he begins to tell us why there is a law. In other words, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the law, the Levitical commands, and uh, the things that are required, and, and things that sometimes can get in the way of our relationship to God. Uh, for instance, in, in Jesus' time, the Pharisees and others had so wanted to protect the law that they built, and this was their word, they built a hedge around it. Now, they didn't have fences like we have today with barbed wire, electric fences, and all that. Many times the fence that you kept uh, your animals in was a hedge growing up bushes around it that the animals couldn't get out of and other animals couldn't get into um, to, to protect them. Uh, so they built a hedge around the law to protect it. A case in point was if a chicken laid an egg on the Sabbath, you couldn't eat that egg because it was work on the part of the chicken. If somebody got a, a, a cut on the Sabbath, you could put a bandage on it, but you couldn't put medicine on it because the medicine would cause the the cut to heal, and that was work for the body. See, we get into uh, what we call nitpicking, and uh, and God never intended the law to be for nitpicking. He intended it to be to help us to know how to live uh, and how to live well. Now, for Paul, he gets into it and he says, nobody can live by the law. You can't do it. And you read that in the beginning parts of Romans chapter 3. Nobody can live by the law. And of course, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is to live like God wants us to live. We've all failed to do that. Most of us have failed to do even to live by what our parents had hoped for us. We, we come short on that one too. Uh, so he says all have sinned, Jew or Gentile, we've all sinned. We're in that same condition. And then he will go on to say, there's one God. Uh, the Gentile may worship a different image or understanding of God, but Paul says that isn't a God, that's an idol. Like the psalmist says, um, we take and we take and, and fashion from wood that we cut down an image of something and then we bow down and worship it. And, and the prophet Isaiah said that's crazy. The psalmist uh, says it's crazy in 115, Psalms 115. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he would say, yes, there are fake gods or there are false gods, but there's only one real God. And he says that in, in, um, in, in this uh, uh, chapter 3 of, of the thing, uh, where he says, there, uh, is there a God of the Jews only? Is he, or is God God of the Jews only? Is he not a God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of course of Gentiles. Because there's only one God, so that God has to be that. Now he argues that from what we would call the Shema. The Shema is Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's what a good Jew would recite. Uh, certainly early in the morning, but perhaps even at other times during the day. Hear, O Israel. The word Shema means hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. And you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. All right? Now, he's not saying about commandments. He's talking about a love relationship, a, a right relationship with God. He's speaking to the Jew, but he's also speaking to the Hebrew. And, and that's why when in many of the stories of Jesus in the New Testament, we come across this word of God-fearers. These were Gentiles who did not go through the right of becoming Jews, but nonetheless wanted the, the experience of worshiping a God who had a high ethical standard, uh, who wasn't one to pick favorites uh, like the, the Greek gods and the Roman gods. Uh, um, they would be nice to some people, but not to everybody. Uh, they would be nice to some of the other gods, but not to all the gods. And, and so there was a god named Prometheus, and he gave fire to mankind. Now that was the teaching 
of, of the Greeks that Prometheus gave fire to mankind for, so that they could be warm, so that they could cook their food. And the other gods didn't like it. And so they, they made Prometheus tied into a rock in the sea. And an eagle came and tore out his bowels and guts every day. And then they would heal overnight. And the next morning, the eagle would come again, you see. And then there was uh, the, the story of, of one of the gods uh, that, uh, again, gave gifts to people. And, and he was punished by having to roll a stone up a hill, only to have it roll back down and to have to roll it back up again. You see, no, that was kind of a hopeless, helpless situation. Um, the Jews didn't see that God, Yahweh, as that, but rather as a God who uh, was there to help and to claim them and to um, bring hope to their lives and, and give them a, a guide in the way to live. Now, long before the law, the law came through Moses, as Jesus said, um, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, but it also came way before that. If you go back into the book of Genesis, you find the story of Noah. And one of the statements that regards it is, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, God saw Noah not because he was the great man, but because he was the man that God could use. And he came to him and said, Noah, I need you to build a boat. Now, building a boat is not necessarily a righteous act. There are very ungodly people that can build boats. But God said to Noah, you build a boat, and Noah built the boat. Now, did that mean that everything was hunky-dory? No, I don't think so. I think there were, there were times when Noah probably felt, Lord, this is ridiculous. My neighbors are making fun of me. Uh, I'm building a boat here way a long ways from any ocean, and, and that kind of thing. And how in the world am I going to get all those animals into that boat? And, and particularly rattlesnakes. I really don't want to pick up rattlesnakes, you know. So there, there can be questioning, but he still obeyed. Uh, doesn't mean he had no doubts. There's a story in the New Testament about a man that had his son uh, with uh, what we would call epilepsy. Uh, he had seizures, and those seizures would injure him. He would, he would hurt himself on stones. He would fall into fires. Uh, he came to the disciples of Jesus to have his boy healed. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. Um, when Jesus came down from the mountain with his three disciples, James, John, and Peter, the man came to him. I, he was thoroughly frustrated and desperate. And he came and he said, can you do something for my, my boy? I asked your disciples and they couldn't do anything. And, and Jesus said, all things are possible to the one who believes. Do you believe? And the man with great honesty said, I believe, help my unbelief. You see, we don't live in a perfect world. We don't, he couldn't believe in the way that would guarantee he was desperate and Jesus responded to his desperateness. As we talked about that last week with the woman who came to Jesus up in Tyre, in the city of Tyre, and, and asked for Jesus to help her. Uh, that reminds me that I forgot last week to tell you about Hiram, who uh, uh, came down. King Hiram helped David, but there was another Hiram up there who was married to a Hebrew woman, and he helped to build Solomon's temple. Now, the Gentiles weren't supposed to work on that, but you see, he was part Jew, so he could, and he was a craftsman. And Solomon had him come down. He wasn't King Hiram, he was a different Hiram. It was a later time. But the interesting thing was, he was married to a Jewish woman. And he was living up there in Tyre. So that's, that's a part that was, that's still working together. Now that's a, just an aside from last week that I forgot to mention. But anyway, uh, this, this uh, uh, sense of, of the oneness of God was part of the Jewish faith. And so they welcomed people uh, to come. They couldn't participate in the fullness of the synagogue, but they could be observers. And, and they could pray in, in their own way to this Hebrew God. Um, and, and, and that was important to them. And even, again, going back a number of weeks to where we had the centurion who was a God-fearer that came to Jesus uh, for his servant, um, he had built a synagogue out of his own money.
for the Jews. So there was a, a, a good relationship in many times. Now there was the bad relationships too, uh, where the Gentiles um, persecuted the Jews. And that's still happening today. Uh, that's happened down through the years. Uh, for some reason or other, um, people have just enjoyed persecuting uh, Jews. Now Jews could do the same thing to others. You see, and that's why Paul could say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So uh, that's that's the situation. Now the law was to help us to live. There's nothing in the law that, that makes us a bad person. When it says, you shall not kill, that's probably a good thing. You shouldn't go around just shooting people. Okay? Shouldn't do that. Uh, Johnny Cash had a song called Folsom Prison Blues. And in that he talks about where he said, I shot a man just to watch him die. I don't think most of us would say that was a good thing. Does it happen? Yes, it does happen. Um, Saddam Hussein who ruled in Iraq for uh, many times, was noted for um, killing people, even throwing some people into a pool of piranhas uh, who just destroyed him, uh, you know, ripped him to shreds and killed him. Uh, there are people who have that warped sense of, uh, of, of life. Uh, thou shalt not bear false witness. You shouldn't tell lies about people. That's a probably a pretty good thing, you know. Tell, not telling lies about people. Um, you shall not covet. Now, Paul seemed to have that one. That one seemed to be, in Romans, he talks about, I know what I should do, and I don't do it. And I know what I shouldn't do, and I do do it. And then he goes to cite the 10th the commandment, thou shalt not covet, or you shall not covet, or you shall not desire what somebody else has. Now, little children can do that. I, I have two dogs. The one dog, if the one dog is playing with something, the other dog wants it. Now, if he gets up and leaves it, couldn't care less for it. But if the other, other dog's playing with it, then he wants it. And he barks and he barks and he barks. And, and gives me a headache uh, because of that. Uh, no, Paul says I shouldn't, but I do. I do covet. And then, you know, the, the other point is, Paul says, if you break one law, you've broken them all. Well, now, I think that if I didn't go to church on Saturday, it's not the same as killing somebody. It may be bad, it's breaking the law. Yes, it's breaking the law. But there may be a difference. I think that if I, uh, if, if I uh, uh, want something somebody else has, it's probably not as bad as dishonoring my mother and my father. Okay? Uh, I think there are differences in there. But Paul says if you failed at one, you failed in everything. Okay? We've all come short of the glory of God. That's part of his, his statement. Then he goes on to say that following the law doesn't keep or doesn't make a Jew um, favorable to God because none of us can do it. And that's, that's his conclusion. You can't do it. So Now Wesley believed that we could attain, John Wesley founded the Methodist Church, believed that a person could attain sinless perfection. I'm going to tell you honestly, and this may be a shock to you, I have not gotten there. I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And if you don't believe me, ask my wife. And she can uh, uh, witness to that. Okay, But he believed you could because of the grace of God. He said the grace cannot come short of what God has promised. By the same token, um, we, we, uh, we know that God is a gracious God and a forgiving God. And so uh, that, that becomes our hope. That's, that's the one God. Now, in this scripture, and, and more in chapter 4, but in this scripture, it, there's a word called reckon. And I mentioned where that comes from Logos. It doesn't mean that it makes us righteous. It means that God treats us as righteous. Now, if he made us righteous, we would never sin again. But he treats us as though we haven't sinned. And that's called justification. Just as if I've never sinned. I remember hearing that years ago when I was a little kid. Just as if I've never sinned. That's what justifying is. But I do sin. And, and in the future, I will sin again. That's just my nature. Okay? The old man, Paul says, was crucified, but the old man gets out of the grave and comes back, and he haunts us still. Augustine said, years and years ago, lived about the year 300, he said, in this life, all perfection has some imperfection. And I, I think that. And, and then another man, and I can't remember his name, said, God made the world out of nothing, 
but the nothing still shows through. And that's true of me. He, he made me out of the dust of the earth, and the dust still shows through. If you read uh, in the Psalms, it says uh, how we have failed God, and then he remembers that we are dust. I sometimes forget that, but he remembers. All right. So he reckons, or he thinks of me, he looks at me as though I am sinless. And he loves me. Now, I'm going to sin, and if you read Romans 8, and that's again part of Romans, it talks about how Jesus sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Because we come short of what we should be. And Jesus is interceding to the Father saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Sound familiar from a cross? Yeah. Forgive them. And, and he does. He gives us a new start and a new chance. Now, we haven't attained sinless perfection, but that's part of it uh, that, that's there. Uh, one of the things that, that's made a statement here, and this is God reckoning. Uh, it says uh, that um, whom God put, well, uh, let me go back here to the beginning. This is one sentence. Okay, it's a long sentence. Paul gets going and he doesn't know how to put a period in any place uh, on the thing. So it's, it's one uh, phrase after another after another, but I'm going to try to pick up at a spot here. Uh, Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the grace of God, and he gave us grace, justified us by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice. There's the metaphor. A sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. There's that word faith. Jesus just dying uh, can accomplish whatever God wants it to accomplish. But Paul puts that, that little added thing that you've got to have the faith before it becomes effective uh, in the thing. You know, James will disagree with Paul on that, but, uh, but that's a Paul. He did this to show his righteousness, to show God's righteousness. God's righteousness is his love, his care, his forgiveness uh, to us. Because in his divine forbearance, that's part again of the God. I'm not very forbearing. I'm very impatient. I want it done now. But in his divine forbearance, he has passed over the sins previously committed. In other words, he's saying the sins that were committed before Jesus died on a cross. That person lived and died. They died in their sins. God didn't judge them. He forbore to judge them. And so when Christ died, God applied the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus' death and his blood to them. And, and if you read Ephesians, it says he led captivity captive. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but it may well mean that those people who lived before Jesus, who were aware of their sins, um, but didn't know about Jesus, uh, God held off judgment until Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven, and, and Jesus coming out of the grave led the spirits of those who had died uh, to freedom. Now, I, I, I can't swear that that's exactly what that means, but I'm not the only person that believes that that's what that means. Um, people uh, smarter than me believe that same thing. And so God reckons righteousness. Not because we are righteous, but because His grace forgives and heals and makes us whole in Him. Now, uh, there's another thing about that, and, and I bring that up uh, because Paul said, I wouldn't know sin if it wasn't for the law. And, and if Paul has one thing to say about the law, it's that it shows us where we are. And I think that is a good thing. It doesn't condemn us because God seeks to forgive us, but it helps us to know. Um, we don't have to pray in the abstract. You know, we can do that. Uh, we, there are prayers that say, Lord, we've done those things which we should not have done and we have left undone those things which we ought to have done. It doesn't mention anything in particular. Okay, that's a general confession. Um, but Paul will say, I, I, I covet, I struggle with covet. You may have a different sin than my sin in terms of the dominant sin, but we've all sinned. And we stand in need of the grace of God. And that's, that's what it's about. Now, let me illustrate that with some of the stories of Jesus. One, he told a story about two sons. He said the father came to the son and, and he said to the son, go and work in the fields today for me. And the son said, 
Sure, I will. And he didn't do it. He went off and went with some of his friends, perhaps someplace else. Maybe went to the movies. I don't know. He wasn't around back then. But he didn't do what the father said. He said he would, but he didn't. That was wrong. Okay? Second son, he's, the father said, go and work in my fields today. And the son said, forget it. I ain't going. I got other plans. I'm not going to go to the field and work today. That was wrong. That was dishonoring his father. Uh, commandment, fourth commandment, honor your father and mother uh, that your days may be long. But he had a change of mind. Okay? He'd done wrong, he had a change of mind, and he went and worked in the field. Now, Jesus said, which son proved to be the son? Both of them could have been disowned. But I think both of them were still reckoned as his sons. In other words, the father said, they're still my sons. Now, case in point, the, another story Jesus told was about a prodigal son where there was an older son that stayed home and worked on the farm. The older son stayed home, but the younger son wanted a better life, wanted more fun in life. He said, Father, give me what's mine. I'm out of here. And the father gave it to him. And he went off and wasted it all, let's say. He had nothing left. His old inheritance was gone. And he's feeding pigs. Not a good job for a Jewish boy. Feeding pigs. And he, that, the, the pigs eat better than he eats. And he said, I could do better as a servant, not as a son, but as a servant of my father. I'm going home. And he goes home. And before he can get the speech out, his father is running down, throws his arms around him, and says, my son was dead, he is alive. Not this rat here is dead. And he's alive. No, my son was dead. Hadn't been any change in the relationship as far as that father was concerned. Had been a change as far as the son was concerned. He was going to be a servant, a slave. Father said, no, you're my son. Now the elder brother who had stayed on the farm all the time and worked and done the job right was struck with jealousy. He, he didn't think that, that brother of his should be allowed back in the family. Okay? Now, he hadn't done anything wrong. The, the other son had done it wrong. He had every right to feel that that son shouldn't be back in the family because he wasted his father's inheritance. And he probably suffered from it too because part of the farm was gone. All right? The father said to him, your brother, he didn't say my son, he said your brother was dead. He's alive. He was lost. And he's been found. He was away and he's home. See, we have to rejoice. Now, the father wasn't looking at the law as being something that could be fulfilled, but as something that would help us to see ourselves and then to see grace as it comes to us. And, and so, you know, we, we have that uh, as part of that. In John 3.16, it doesn't say, for God so judged the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because judgment would have brought condemnation. But it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's our hope. Not because we've been good, but because God is good. Not because we've always done the right thing, but because God always does and thinks the right thing. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this grace and goodness to us in this day. Thank you for the word of hope that we have in Romans and for being the God who cares and forgives and heals. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week.